Hi, so I'm uh, Will Weinweber, and my talk is Relaxing with CouchDB. And uh, before I start, um, I need a, you know, a little bit about the title. It's actually a requirement. It's somewhere in the license that you have to put the word relax within, uh, I think it's 20 words of CouchDB. So they have it there, it's there. When you start it up, it's there. Even when you compile it, it's got there. They're also writing a book. And um, uh, it's, I think it's somewhere in this book that they're writing. I, I haven't found it. but. Uh, so what I want to go through is in this talk is uh, why you should be excited about CouchDB and why you should want to uh, try it out. And then uh, it is significantly different from databases that we're all used to, relational databases. And so I want to give a little bit on how to start approaching this, uh, you know, how you use CouchDB and how to get into that mindset. Uh, so first, I want to talk about you know what CouchDB is and. You know, I saw, you know, there's a couple of people using it. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, has everyone heard of it, though, at least? Yeah. All right, so, um, well, it's a document database, and the, there's no schema. There's no, um, you, know, the, you know, each document can have a different structure from the next one. And usually, though, you know, that's not, you know, it's a little weird, but it's not too much of an issue because you're going to have, you know, all your user documents are going to look the same, all your, you know, if you're doing a blog, all the posts are going to do the same. If you have like books or something in there, they'll all look the same, but they're all mixed in together and jumbled, and there's nothing. Um, so it's, it, that's not an issue. But what is nice is that uh, someone uh, was telling me about an example. They want to do resumes, and you know everyone's resume is different. Like some people have these fields, and some people won't have these fields. And uh, coming up with a database schema that can have every possible thing is pretty annoying. So it's written in Erlang, and from that they get. Uh, it's very concurrent and scalable, and I mean the, the choice of Erlang itself isn't shouldn't be too much of a reason of, to use it or not. It's just some of these things that they've gotten allowed them to develop the, the fashion, get, develop these features much quicker. Uh, the other exciting thing about CacheB is it's built for the web. It's built for web applications, whereas you know relation databases have been around for a long time and they don't quite fit you know what we want to do with databases, and especially with Rails, since we treat the database just as a place to store and retrieve data, and a lot of times don't use any of the extra features. Like, for me, like, there's no difference when I use MySQL or Postgres, because I, I rarely take advantage of the features that, you know, Postgres would offer over MySQL. Um, the interface for CouchDB is restful, and this is pretty cool. Like, when you Get a, you, you get a document, you put it, you delete it, and it has all the same conventions that we're used to as uh, Rails developers for a RESTful thing. Um, the last thing is that what you're basically doing is storing and achieving JSON documents, and this by itself doesn't seem that awesome, but this is actually the reason that I like it the most. It's You can sol like solve some problems that you just can't do with a relational database. And so, you know, you all know what JSON looks like. It's, you know, a subset of YAML of sorts. And so th this example is, uh, you know, like if you're writing a book, it has all many chapters. And if you were going to do this in a relational database, you'd have to have a separate table for the chapters. And where with this, with the document database, you can have that all right in the same place where it makes sense. You know, the chapters don't really make sense to exist by themselves, but they make sense in the context of the book. A similar thing is you could have, you know, a blog with all the, you know, a post, and all the comments could be in the post, um, or, you know, anything like this. And this, this is the reason why um, I started using Cache to be uh, several months ago, is because I had this problem where I had, you know, my main model that, you know, is what the user was actually interacting with, but it had many, you know, other things, like a book has many chapters, and I need to do versioning on this, where if any of the, any of the chapters were touched, any of the information about the book, any, anything that was touched, I needed to re do another revision. And, you know, with a relational database, like, it's really painful, because like, you have to keep track of all these different things, but with this, when they're all in the same place, you can just do another revision really easy. So another feature that it has is that it doesn't really have locking in the traditional sense of a relational database. This is the awesome thing I drew in uh, OmniFocus. It's really high quality. But so with a traditional locking database, if a write comes in and other people want to read it, they have to wait for that write to finish. And but with the way that they do it is there's no when when you write it you're not actually changing the data that's there, you're adding another thing. So the old, the old one can still be read. So these first two reads 
would be read as the old data, and then that last one that comes in, that'll get the new data. But so you don't have to slow down. Kashibi can you know, constantly be throwing out requests even while writes are going on on the same data. Uh, like I mentioned, it's, it's add only, and not just adding documents or updating documents add only. The way they have it structured um, is that even deletes don't actually delete the existing data. And what, what and a consequence of this is that your Couchbase database is never in a bad state. When you you know hit Control C and stop the server, it's down. It doesn't have to wait and write anything. And when you start it back up again, it's up. There's no. It doesn't have to check. For anything, you could trip, you could pull the power cord from your cache be server and plug it back in, and you're not really going to lose anything except for when I was trying to get it when it was down. Um, the replication that they do is pretty cool. Like uh, built-in, two cache be servers can replicate with each other, and they have this idea of eventual consistency. If you want uh, more in depth on this, the uh, the book that I mentioned earlier that they're writing, if you go to the cache be website, there's a little book thing that goes into this in much more detail. And um, so if you have two databases and I, I make a document here and the other guy makes a document, um, and when they go to replicate, you know, there could be collisions. They, there's a, a programmatic way that they have that one of them would always win. And the old, the old revisions are never thrown away. So you can, you know, it's up to you to d decide what you want to do in the case of conflicts, but uh, it's all there. There's another, another cool thing that I'm not going to get into too much, but there's been, since CacheB is a web server, because it does everything over HTTP, you can have, there's a couple of people are doing like couch database only blogs and like a Twitter client, and all the code is in CacheB, all the JavaScript and everything, and they can all, since the replication works, they all kind of replicate amongst each other, and it's kind of this amorphous application development that kind of like, uh, one, one of the developers of this link, uh, likened it to TI calculators in high school, how everyone kind of hacked on their version and spread it around. Uh, you know, with the, uh, the multi-tenant thing yesterday, you can do this pretty easily. Uh, you know, there's still some of the issues, but you can do multiple databases very easily because it's just in the, um, it's just in the URL when you're getting the, the rest stuff. So you can have, uh, you know, if, if you're doing something like uh, Basecamp or something where everyone's data is different, you can have it in a separate database without having to, you know, the time spent to create databases much. And uh, it's really easy to integrate with other services such as like Lucene or other full text search things. They have a, a nice little API for, you know, putting the data back across. And there's a way actually to store files <clears throat> in, you can have, any document can have any number of file attachments. And it, they do it in a smart way. When you want to, uh, when you get a document that has these file attachments, it doesn't start streaming the file over. It just gives you some of the metadata. And then um, when you actually want the file, you do something different to actually retrieve those files. So the big difference is that it uses this concept of views instead of queries. And the views are, um, sorry, just a second. Um, the views, this is the, the biggest like conceptual difference. Like all the other stuff, you know, it's kind of like a database that has, you know, a couple cool features or something, because it's the same idea of, you know, storing and getting data. But the, these views, that's, you know, the hardest kind of stumbling block. Um, they're stored just as documents like anything else, so when you replicate or whatever, they're all there. Um, and the views use these, this view server, and default when you install it, you get um, a JavaScript one in, in SpiderMonkey. And um, there is uh, built-in stuff, I mean, there, there's a way to swap that out, and you could use Ruby if you, don't, if you really don't like JavaScript, or I've seen uh, some Python ones. Um, I haven't actually personally done this because the JavaScript is powerful enough and, you know, from all the uh, Ajax stuff, you know, everyone's familiar with JavaScript and it works really well. The concept that it uses is MapReduce, which, um, you know, is, is sort of a borderline buzzword, but it, it works really well. So you have the, uh, the map step, which goes through every single document and then the, re the reduce step is, was optional. Um, so the first time you run it, it has to, a view, it has to go through every document, which is horrendously slow. Not even, you know, if you have, you know, books in there and you also have, um, you know, articles or something else, it has to, it can't just go through the books because it doesn't know which documents are books and which aren't until it goes through each one. But then once that's done, 
it builds an index so it doesn't have to do it, so it's much faster. So, so that map step, what you do is you go through each document and you have a key and a value, and then it sorts it by the keys, and that's how it um, persists, and that's how you sort of query it once you have a view. And I already, I already talked about the persistence index. Oh, and the other thing is, so it has the index, and then any new data that comes along, any deletions or updates or new documents, the next time it only has to go through those new things. So then, as long as you keep, as long as you keep your views fresh, and there's some built-in mechanisms to, um, you know, you can maybe trigger it every hundred thing, or you can have a cron job to run every couple minutes to just run your, your views in case no one's actually accessing those particular ones. And that, um, that'll keep everything nice and speedy. And um, so th when, you have, when you're writing a web application, like you, you know ahead of time which queries are gonna be run. So, this, so that, that initial slow thing, it really isn't a problem. So since it's built on HTTP and REST, you get some benefits with that. Um, the biggest one is being that you c it's cacheable using um, existing tools like the reverse proxies and uh, load balancers. You can you know, have a cluster of cached to be servers and you don't need special you know, tooling to do this. Your standard stuff that you're already using will straight up work. Um, and since it's using REST, you know, we're, we're all familiar with REST and it's easy to use. So, getting started, uh, we want to, uh, so I want, I want to get you all on the right path to, you know, see, you know get out and try to use this. And um, what you have to do is, you have to install it from head because the latest re release version doesn't have a lot of the um, tool, tools that, uh, some of the, the newer gems and stuff that are out require it to be at least 0.8, and I think the release version is only, I, I don't even know. But the, um, the latest seven head is like 0.9, and they're, they're working on the way to 1.0. Um, so you, you need to already have Erlang installed, because that's what it's built off. You need the SpiderMonkey uh, JavaScript engine, and this thing called IC, if you're doing it on the Mac, you need this ICU, which is like an inter internationalization thing, and the error message you get if you don't use it is kind of um, not, not too clear, so that's, that's what you need. Uh, I think the best tool out there right now is uh, Couchrest from Jcrest. This is the, the GitHub thing. And it really does a lot of way to um, provide a nice API for you to use in Ruby. And, uh, you know, default, the API to Couch database is, you know, fairly simple. But this, you know, provides, you know, just a, a thin layer of tools that you can build your own stuff off of. And a lot of people have built more complex stuff off Couchrest but this is a, a great place to start. So this is some code example of what uh, Couchrest looks like. And you, th this, this database bang method, it sets it up as the database that you're gonna use, and if, um, if it doesn't exist, it'll create it. If it already exists, it'll just use it. So this is one way that you can, like if you were gonna do a multi-database thing, uh, you could just put the username in there, you know, like uh, in the string, or you know, however you, you want to shard. So saving it, you just you give it a uh, you know a, a hash, and it'll turn that into JSON and save that. And then you get a response back with the revision number, uh, the ID, and then like the status. And then you know, th you know, this is just really easy getting data in and out. It's it's pretty easy. Um, and just to prove that it is, does actually work over HTTP, you can go back to the command line and just, you know, get the URL there and you get the data back. So, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's just proving that I'm not lying that it's over HTTP. And so if you're gonna change something and save it, then the revision number changes and uh, the, you know, everything else, I mean, the change does and the other thing stays the same. And if you destroy it, if you get it, it you know, it'll raise, and try to find it again, it'll raise an error. Um, also built in, this is the uh, CouchDB's default uh, uh, kind of user interface. This is once you install it, you just go to uh, the, the, the port that you're at, slash underscore utils, and you get this nice interface for viewing your data, and you can do uh, some uh, editing and stuff right in here. And you'll see, this is the one that, from the previous example there, it stores the old version, and 
It only stores it however until you can pack the database. So you, can't, you can't use this, it's tempting to use it as a, a versioning thing built in, but you can't because um, you, uh, uh, periodically you want to compact your database to save space and you'll lose, uh, you'll lose all your old versions when you do that. So the view thing I find is the hardest and uh, you know, thing to wrap your head around. So I want to spend some time going over views. And so this is uh, JavaScript here, and what it does is it takes in a doc, document, and for this one, maybe I just want to, this one, you can, so the documents are, the view documents are namescaped, and so this is books, is a, you know, just arbitrary word, and then all is the name of this particular view. Um, so what it does is it goes through every single document, and if it's a book, if, you know, the type, that's just an arbitrary field that's on the database, if that's a book, we can admit it, we can use null for the ID, or for the key, and it's, it'll just use the ID of the document, and then emit the entire thing of the document. And this is the, the view in, the, in the, the web interface. You have all the, uh, all the IDs, and then you have all the data, because that's what we admitted, we admitted the entire document. So this is a, you know, a fairly trivial view, but you can see, um, you know, this is you know, kind of uh, you know, just a primer here. And so uh, what you can do that's more powerful is if you, instead of just emitting only the books, only one type of document, you can, for the key, if you put the, you know, the type of it and then the document, what you have now is a queryable view. And so the old, like, so I just made, for this example, I just made a, um, I think 30, yeah, 30 documents, 10 of each, 10 of each type article, uh, book, and maybe user. And so the old, the old one from the previous slide that just was books only, there's 10 of those. And if you did this one, the, if, if you call this one by type, because that's kind of what um, you know, we're doing here, we're, we're kind of doing a by type query. And if you just do it by itself, it'll return everything. If you do it by, and pass in the key, oops, if you pass in the key book, then we get 10, which is the same 10 that we got before. So what's happening is when it's building this view up to disk, you know how I said it was uh, you know, persisting the view, it stores it as a tree and it does it by the, the type. So in this case by the type because that's what we're emitting. And so it'll go down and just pull out the ones that match. So that's how you can do, do kind of uh, you know, customizable queries. And you know, this is very powerful because once this view is built and you, you, know, you, you keep it updated, I mean, this is instant. It doesn't have to um, you know, do any extra work once, you know, as long as the view is you know, reasonably fresh. Uh, for example of a one with a, a reduced thing, this one you know, is just doing the size. So we're, we're still doing the same map step as before, so we can do it by type. But then the other thing, so then, then they get passed into the reduce function. And you know, this one you know, just returns the length of the values array. So what we got here is the first example, you know, not, not doing any sort of uh, passing in of parameters or queries, we get three, which you know, that doesn't make sense because you know, well, there's 30 documents. But what happens is, is you need to tell it to group um, to group the results. And it's a, one, one thing to be worried about is when you're, when you're testing the views in that, um, that, that web interface that comes with it, it automatically passes this in. And th this, this is a, a common stumbling point because you, know, you test your view out in that thing and you get the right results, but then when you use it from your code, it's all wrong. And you have to remember to, uh, to tell it to group the results. So once you do that, we have the, uh, you know, the article, book, and user, and each one is 10. And if you only want part of that data, it's the same thing as before. We can pass in the book, and then we get the 10. So, um, so the, the versioning thing, that's the big stumbling point that brought me to CacheDB. So one way to solve this is if you have um, you know, a version number that you know, just increments, you have to increment it yourself in your code, and then um, you know, some sort of master ID that links all the um, all the versions together, and that's usually what I what I do is it's the first the, you know when someone creates a new thing, that first one will be version zero in the master ID, and then from then on we can add in um, the new versions to that 
group, and then any other additional data, you know, would just sit there in the document. And how does this look when you want to, when you want to get this? So what, what this does is it returns the newest version, and it does it, you know, you know, fairly simply. So what we, we do it for the key that we're emitting, you know, that we're going to be doing searches on, is the that master ID field that we added in, and then we return the whole, you know, the whole um, the document there. And then what makes this work is a reduce step. We just go through all of the versions, pick out, pick out the max one, and then return that. Um, the, what, in the reduce step, they come not, so they come sorted by not the, ma the, uh, the version number, so we can't just pick the last one off or whatever. Um, and one of the, uh, the more complicated things, there's a great article if you search uh, Couch to be joins, and the, the joins is in quotes because they're not really joins, is uh, view collation. And this is one of the more um, non-obvious ways to use the, the view, the view capability of CouchDB. So, so you know, since you can have these deep structures for you know the blog, the common blog uh, comment, you know, idea, it's possible to have the comments in line of the post, and you know that that's attractive because it's all you know all together, all one thing. The problem being, if you have like a, you know, if, if a lot of people are trying to post at once, you're going to get more conflicts, and that, that could be hard to deal with. So you can store them separately, just as you would in a relational database. Uh, but then the problem is, is how are you going to get all of them together? And you know, you could do two queries, sure. You know, get get my blog post, figure out what that is, and then get all the comments. But a nice way is if there's a way to do it all in one step. And so. For this example, we have you know the ID and reversion number. Those come you know with CatchDB for our uh, our posts over here and then our comments. And um, you know also in the data here, they would reference that they're you know part of this um, you know they're for that post. You know sort of like you know foreign keys in a relational database. And so what you can do is when you're you know you're doing your your view to you can emit either if it's a post or if it's a comment. And the key thing, like before I was just using one single value for the key, and for most cases that's what you want to do. But you can, you can have arbitrary JSON structures as your keys. And CouchDB has uh, a way that's it's documented of how it will um, crawl through, and how, how it um, knows how to compare, sorry, how to compare two different JSON things. So what happens here is, if you have the, you know that, that tree idea of what it builds, this you know it's it, it's, it's hard to, to wrap your head around. But what happens is is when you pass in just a single document ID and nothing in the second spot, it'll give you all of it, and it'll give you the zero and one makes it so that the blog post comes first and the rest of them are comments. And this is this is really powerful. I mean, uh, by having the full power of you know a real programming language like JavaScript as your querying thing. You gain a lot of um, power, you know, relative to you know just SQL statements that get you know long and nasty, and you know complex joins. So this is my favorite. So if we, we have all that that theory, and we want to pull it now into Rails. Um, there's a couple libraries, like I said, that are built on top of CouchRest. One of them that comes with CouchRest currently, but isn't going to stay in there for the whole time, is CouchRest Model. Um, and I, I really like this. I, I've been using this, um, and uh, I, I know at least uh, of at least one guy who's you know pulled this out of CouchRest in order to maintain it after um, it gets removed from the CouchRest thing. And so this lets you do similar. Um, you know, you can inherit from CouchRest, and so you get a whole bunch of um, things that you know, sort of like Active Record, but you know, with CouchDB spin on it. And um, to get this working, you need to put uh, this guy in your um, environment RB. You, you don't have to do this, but this gives you the um, you know the kind of test development production system that I, that I you know we're used to. Um, but that's not uh, strictly necessary. You can call it you know whatever you want, or if you know you're doing multiple databases, you would you would want to do this elsewhere. Um, yeah. So the, like uh, the couch potato from this guy who was actually mentioned before. Uh, I really want to like it. It's, it has a whole bunch of features that are almost there, and I really want to like it. And I, I should just you know finish them. But 
like it, it does the versioning thing. It does, um, you know, sort of like an ordered list and a whole bunch of other things that are, you know, it took kind of like Rails, uh, some common Rails plugins for, for Actor Record and threw them in there. Um, and it's pretty nice. There's Active Couch, which is supposed to be, it's supposed to be closer more to Active Record. I know there's a data mapper, um, a data mapper adapter for it, but I haven't used that personally. Um, I mean, just sticking close enough to the, uh, the, the couch rest, you go, go, you go a long way with that. You don't really need a lot of these things. But it's not all roses in couch to be land. The, um, it's, it's currently a big moving target. There's a lot of uh, changes they haven't hit 1.0 yet. Um, I'm, not sure wh I'm not sure what their time scale is, but um, you do have to keep, keep up with it, which you know, isn't a huge problem, but it's something to be aware of. It's not, um, not a whole lot of people have taken it to you know, production things. There's not a lot of stories that you can get out um, from that. Um, th so the arbitrary queries are slow, um, like I've touched on previously, but you know, for a web application, that's not really a problem. But if you need to do like reporting or something that you know, you're not running these queries over and over and over again, um, this isn't the choice for you. Um, the lack of supporting tools, since it is new, you don't have you know, the kind of um, infrastructure built on top of it like you do for relational databases. Uh, you lose out on a lot of um, the stuff from, you know, they, you take for granted from Active Record that, you know, it does a whole bunch of stuff for you that just isn't there when you're doing uh, Couch because it hasn't been built up yet. I mean, there, there's some uh, spikes in that, in, in that direction, but they're still all relatively new. Um, and that, you know, it's a pain point because we're used to really quick development with Active Record and um, you just have to do a lot more for yourself where you didn't have to before. Uh, the biggest thing that I found was lack of intuition. Like, I get relational databases. I understand what they're doing. And this, you know, is new. I'm not, you know, I, we, I don't have um, a straight up, you know, answer, you know, like our gut feeling that has been built up over time of, you know, what's gonna work and what isn't. So it's a lot of experimentation. You have to, um, you know, you know, play with it a little bit more and figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, you know, there's some great articles out there, but not as much, you know, not nearly as much has been written for, um, for relational databases. Um, and which, here, here's what I want you to do next. I want you, um, you know, next weekend, and not, not here on the, uh, the conference internet, but download Erlang, download CouchDB, get it running and just play with it. It's not scary, don't be afraid of it. It's fun, uh, and you know you don't have to build a whole application on it. Just get, just get CouchRest, put some data in, put some data out. Um, I do this a lot when I'm trying to test new features. You know, build up you know a, a 300 or 1,000 different documents. You know, loop through, put them up, and start, start playing with the view feature because once you get the hang of it, it's really powerful. And you're really going to like it. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say about CacheB itself. I know, I'm sure there's uh, questions and I'll be willing to answer them. So, yeah. Does the ports install of CouchDB now work on OSX? Because for a while it wasn't working. Um, I don't know if it works, but I, the last time I tried it, it was way behind. And, um, and like the, the Lang Alex, or the, um, not Lang Alex, but the uh, J. Chris CouchRest gem, um, it requires it to be at least, I think, 0.8, and the port one, like, they haven't released, released something in a while, and so a lot of, the, I'm not sure exactly what doesn't work, but I know it doesn't work. Yep. Um, Is it, do you have a recommended link as far as where to get instructions on it? Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, if you go to the couchdb.org, their wiki has um, in, installation instructions for every OS, and then there's a section to do it by source, and, um, you know, it's just, you just uh, grab, you know, grab the seven head. You have to do a, a bootstrap command, and that'll check to make sure you have everything configured and installed. And I mean, it's, you know, it's it's pretty slick. Yeah. Uh, how's it for uh, memory? Um, so I I haven't uh, profiled that myself, um, but I know some people who have talked about that, and it's actually. Um, I, I don't have any hard numbers, but I think it's at least comparable, if not slightly better, than 
like maybe MySQL for comparably sized things. I think someone said that they, um, like, it, like storage wise, it, it wasn't as much. Um, I'm not sure about running, running memory. Yeah. Um, you'll have more problems with your Ruby app and object creation, your object space, than you'll have with your Couchlet. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Um, because if you're using Couchlet, then you, let's say you generate a view, your view has 10,000 items in it. Couchlet's model will actually instantiate 2,000 objects for you happily. So you'll actually you'll run into those memory issues because we were doing something where we had 20,000, maybe uh, maybe there was like. 1K of text in there, but 20,000 of these over and over again actually got us up to a bunch of resident size in, in an IRD session. So, so what they want to worry about. So you're saying that... Uh, yeah, I'm saying the couch thinking by itself isn't bad, but you're going to run into Ruby issues if you're using the couch press model first. But, uh, you know, as long as you have same, like, you can, because couch should be, you can pass in the, uh, the limits. Right. So that you're not creating, uh, you know, hundreds of Ruby objects at once. Has 10,000 or 20,000 or 100,000 items in it. Right. I'll have one do that for you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, are you, what is the lit, what's the top number of documents that you've placed into a CouchDB instance and had it still be usable at this point? And is there a theoretical limit or a limit that is a hard limit defined by the Couch? Um, I'm not sure if there's a hard limit. Uh, personally, just in playing around with it, I did, um, I think I generated, the max I've done personally is, I think, 3 million documents. And that, you know, had a, you know, I think it was like, a, it was a lot of storage. But, um, you know, I just wanted to, you know, see how long the, uh, the, the view stuff took. And, you know, the first time it took, you know, a whole lot of time. And then, well, uh, maybe like 10 to 20 minutes. Um, and, but then I did, the, you know, the same thing instantly, you know, afterwards and it was instant, which, you know, that's, you know, I thought that was pretty neat. Um, yeah, so I, I have, I don't know if there's a hard set limit if, for that, um, but, uh, and, and, you know, these weren't, these weren't, I want to keep in mind, these weren't like complex documents either, they were just, they had a random number and then, you know, I was saying, give me all the, then the view was, um, all of them greater than a certain number, and you could change the number and just, you know get you know skim off the top. Yeah. The uh, the point you made about the not being suitable for two dynamic queries or, or uh, yeah. yeah. How would you characterize the, the queries I see are written in JavaScript, right? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, what is what we're going to so okay. are they ca are they cached? What? Okay, so, so, um, why, why is it dynamic, uh, more dynamic queries, uh, why is it poorly performing? Or sure, sure. So what it has to do is go, th when, you, when you make a new view, it has to go through every document and build its, you know, this, this is my tree. It has to build my, uh, it has to build the index. Okay. And, or, you know, build, write that tree out to disk. Okay. And, um, and there's no way for it to, there's no other indexes for it to go off of. So it has to go through each one. So, so you should really think of those queries as indexes that you're generating. Right, right, right. That's why they call them views and not queries. I've, I've been using the, the query um, word just, you know, because it's, you know, what it's comparable to in the relational database. Okay. But, um, Once yeah. you build them, it's, it's fast. It's, it's, it's you know, practically instant. Um, and then, so, you know, with these revision numbers, that's how it keeps track of how old the, the view is, and then the next time it just goes through the new ones or any of the changes. So that's why you have to keep your views fresh, because if you don't, um, like let's say you have an app and maybe one part of it isn't hit often, the first user that goes there is going to have to crawl through all the changes elsewhere. So that's why you need to be aware and keep um, all, all your views you know, fresh. Yeah. Um, does CouchDB have anything where you can, um, like, in one HTTP request, send it a bunch of keys and then have it send it back? Um, I'm not, I, I don't know for the views. I know for the, um, maybe, I, I don't know the answer to the view things. What you can do is you can bulk, I know you can bulk insert and update data, but I haven't um, had a need to do the view thing, so I haven't looked into that. So I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know that. Like, I'm, like, it's kind of like 
the own, well, you have the n plus one problem, right? If you have like a bunch of articles and a bunch of comments, like the example you gave works for like, if I want one article and all its comments, you can get it all back, but, uh, you know, without that, you have, if you had, you know, 50 articles with 50 comments each, you'd end up with all those HTTP requests without a batch. I know for, for, for this, for this, when you said... If you wanted to get 50 posts of oh. all the comments, that's 51 queries, right? Um, well, you could you could do a trick where the um, where if you had another if you had some sort of way to to, to know ahead of time which uh, I'm not sure. Can I? Yeah. Can I sure. Uh, I think that one of the that's one of the things we were talking about the full having like if you have a post plus all of its comments in a single document, right. then it's one view to right. get all of it all that data. But even if you didn't. You have, I just questioned whether there's a, a valid user interface where you have 50 posts plus all of the comments in one interface. And I would say likely what you end up doing is developing your interface so that you show, for example, the posts first and then a flip open to just a specific set of comments to execute the view to return that set of comments and that should be fast. So that's, that's my take on it. Yeah. And then there be one thing that I, I forgot to mention is that you know, like I said, you know, it was it, my, my, my main reason was for the versioning, and um, but what it, what it allows you to do is, you know, like I, I I realize that I've been hampered somewhat by the relational database kind of way. Like when I when I'm thinking of my models, I'm like, oh, I'm a, you know, I straight up start thinking, oh, I'm gonna have to store this. It's here, the store this here. When really that's not, you know, what I want to do. I I shouldn't be thinking of how um, I need to store this when I'm trying to think of you know, the, the next higher level up at the domain. And this lets you be much more fluid on how you're going to store it. And it's, it's been, um, you know, it's great. I mean, you know, you're supposed to learn a new programming language every year. This is like, you know, a new uh, database paradigm every, you know, couple of years. Is there anything else? Nope, okay, I want to thank you very much. It's been great.